So I was really grateful with this flash forward that I have, and I might have shared it in another podcast. At 21, I started seeing what my life would look like 10 years later if I just carried on doing what I was doing. And I was so scared of it. I quit my Foot Locker job. I went to uni. I started reading books. I went to church. Welcome back, Leverage Addicts. Today, I want to go over the seven financial advice that I would give my younger self. Now, there were two reasons to why I wanted to do an episode like this. The first one is to help anyone who might be slightly earlier in the journey when it comes to wealth building or, you know, investing in general. And second, it can serve as a documentary for myself. I realize I still have a long way to go. And I wanted to see how my thinking would change over time. And this is something I could reflect on. For those who don't know, I started investing in properties and also this business in the same year. And that was 2015. And at the end of that year, I also got married. So this business started just two years after I came out of uni. Property, business, two of the main financial vehicles uh, for me personally. And they still are the main vehicle for me today. With properties, uh, very early on, a broker showed me how I could use the equity in my mom and dad's property so that I could increase my uh, borrowing amount. And so I went to do that. From there, I kept learning more about properties, you know, testing new strategies after I go to a course or get a mentor. One thing I did try to do as much as possible was not put any capital in. Besides using the initial equity from my mom and dad, I looked at recycling the equity on my own properties, and then also structuring JV deals where I own developments with family, friends, and even Andrew, my business partner. So currently my property portfolio, including the JV is seven and a half million plus or minus, and just under 5 million worth of debt. Business-wise, in the first couple of years, I still remember, you know, we just took home like 40, 45,000. Andrew and I reinvested everything and we still apply similar principle today because we pay ourselves a salary and then maybe a little bit more so that we can go on a nice holiday. The profits we usually look to or buy books from brokers that are exiting the industry. It's not a huge business, but it's not a small business either because we have around 40 staff and our goal is to continue to grow this to a point where it will keep growing by itself without our direct involvement. And I guess a lot of people think you know, a business will just grow to 40 staff by itself. It's actually like a lot of reinvestment that we put back in. So if you ask me a question on how I would do it all over again, there would definitely be a few things I would do differently. I know how I could avoid some mistakes and accelerate my results. And so here are the seven things that I would tell my younger self. Now, before we dive in, I only ask for one small favor. That is to leave a comment on what you find interesting or one thing that we could improve on. I would really appreciate that. But for now, let's get into it. The first advice I would give myself is start before you have money. I think investing and finances in general is something that you want to create habits and learning before you have money. We don't really think about it, but most people, even for myself, we would start thinking about it more when we can see an opportunity to do it. I always thought I need money to start. And when I learned how I could use my parents' equity to buy the first property, I started really getting into uh, property investing and understanding it a bit more. But you can only learn so much about properties over six months. And if I begin that education process maybe 18 months earlier, that first property could have been much stronger or maybe seek out people with more wisdom, maybe going to more seminars, reading more books that would have helped a ton. So the first advice is definitely starting to educate yourself really early on. And if you could find somebody that has been doing it for a long time, just as your starting point for a mentorship. The second advice is put some money aside to buy others experience. Now, this is slightly different from the first one. The first one is just like educating yourself early, right? Now, we all know learning from others can accelerate our own success. Seeking mentorship, reading books is definitely one way to go about it. But paying for that knowledge is actually a lot faster. The interest becomes aligned because most people who have that kind of experience and expertise, they don't just give it away. I guess like a lot of people, when I first started, I worried about paying for something that might not help me. And I feel like I'm taking away the capital for investing. But if I could go back, I would convince myself to apportion a part of the capital, say 10%. You know, it's a investment decision because if you carve out 10% of whatever you have 
and put it into education or consultants, I'm quite confident that 10% you put aside is gonna give you significantly higher return on the overall capital. I still remember this when I joined the GRA course, like it was something like 600 bucks for the property school. And inside the course, all the experts were telling you to, hey, come seek us for more advice. I remember Matthew Gilligan at the time had like a $50,000 hand-holding mentorship program. That would be pretty much my whole deposit, right? But instead of spending all that money, I would have tried to pay them to be like, hey, I really want to do this, but I only have this much money. I'm hoping to buy some of your time so you can guide me through the process. I'm confident most experts will be happy to do that if you're willing to pay for their time. So if I could go back, definitely convince myself to pay Matt a thousand bucks for a couple of hours, just one-on-one -on -one and show them what I'm thinking and just get guidance from that because I can almost guarantee myself I would have gotten much greater results if I did that. The third one is to create a mastermind. Now you can see the first three advice being related to each other. The first one is educate yourself early. Second one is paying for somebody. The third one is create that network. Sometimes it might not be people who know more than you. It might just be people that have the same hunger as you. You can give each other ideas and support one another. Learn from each other's success and mistake. And I think that's a really important thing to do if you're trying to become really good at something. It's a very cliche saying, but I do believe you are the average of the few people you spend the most time with. So focusing on building that network, you know, you just ask yourself, who do I have around me that I try to leverage knowledge or push myself on? And I think it's as simple as just joining something like, like a relatively good return on your money network like Appear or like your local property association, or simply paying one of those programs to just join their network. That in itself, will be worthwhile. The fourth advice I would give myself is build a strategy framework and keep modifying it. I think in the beginning, it's really hard because you might be overloaded with all sorts of information. You don't really know what you need to focus on and you could end up focusing on the things that don't give you the best results. I would develop a strategic framework, which if you look at our YouTube channel, I try my best to do a lot of these frameworks for you guys, right? Things like the three C's, if you're looking at properties, what are the most important things that you're looking for? The four values of a property, right? This is a different way of looking at a property. What are the four things that's gonna make a property valuable in the future and what kind of market can you sell it to? And the most important one is the mortgage life cycle. This is a simplified format in terms of what you need to focus on financially. It depends what stage you are in. So having those mental models, and I still use them because I wanna make sure that these frameworks are not just ideas, but something I can apply. And if you don't have any, you can use my ones or you can look in books to make sure you have a strong mental model that you can work off. Fifth one is visualize in decades and not months. One of the first thing when we first start investing on, and I still remember, is like, okay, I'm gonna make this much in 12 months. Okay, I'm gonna make this much in 24 months. The more I started focusing on the long term, the better my results were. Especially when it comes to investment, because there are a lot of short term fluctuation, right? If you get caught in a downturn, you could feel really bad about you know what's happened. But if you think long term, you know, almost everybody that you ask who are a bit wiser and lived a bit longer, if they bought in the peak of the cycle, chances are they still made money on their investments in the long run. And it's another thing that is quite cliche. We always overestimate what we can achieve in 12 months, but what we can achieve in 10 years is, is massive. And I try to reflect back as well. Like at 21, I didn't finish high school. I haven't gone to uni. And if you ask me, could I have what I have today? Like I definitely would have not imagined. So I was really grateful with this flash forward that I have, and I might have shared it in another podcast. At 21, I started seeing what my life would look like 10 years later if I just carried on doing what I was doing. And I was so scared of it. I quit my Foot Locker job, I went to uni, I started reading books, I went to church, I met my wife, and I started answering to the conviction that's in my heart you know, starting a business and, and putting these messages out there about investing. And how you can apply this is simply understand compound interest. You would never guess, like if you're not in finance, you would never guess for something to double in 10 years, it only requires a 7% return on a yearly basis. 
7% improvement is not huge. You could double what you have or whatever skill sets you have over 10 years if you just incrementally increase it by 7%. So if you can increase it by 10, 20% per year, your results could be significantly bigger. Number six is always keep some ammo. What do I mean by that? Never run out of bullets. Building financial resilience in any situation. Now, it's not about not taking risk. It's, it's not about that at all. I think risk should be taken, especially in your earlier years, but you have to stay flexible. The reason why I would tell myself this is in 2021, when interest rate was low and borrowing was easy to come by, I had a gut feeling that I shouldn't max out my borrowing. And that year alone, with my joint venture partners, we did over $10 million of property transactions. And we were still in that musical chair game by the end of 2021. And as probably our biggest deal, we got caught in 2022. And I shared that in another podcast about how we lost over $300,000 on that deal. We didn't have a backup plan. And I also, in that year, pretty much maxed out my borrowing. I think maybe I had like hundred dollars or $200,000 left. And when 2022 came, that was like the best year to buy. I didn't have any ammo. So if I could go back, I definitely think about when times are good, build a much larger buffer. When your gut is telling you, hey, don't do it, probably just stay away from it. But I guess the saving grace for us was that it was calculated risk. Even though there was a big downside for us, it wasn't like a massive downside that would bankrupt us. But not having the ammunition that we need, it really slowed us down in the following years. So number seven, and the last advice that I would give myself is evaluate opportunity costs often. Every financial decision is a trade-off. So we should be assessing our opportunity costs more often. I don't think you need to do it like every single day, but even every half a year or every year, you should be looking at all your opportunities, not just your properties, not just your investments, maybe your job decisions, maybe the network that you're hanging out in. You know, some things you wouldn't change, right? Like your relationship with your close friends and family. Those are always going to be treasured. But I would say when it comes to business, investments, those things you have to think about objectively. Does it still align with your purpose and values? And what are you losing out on if you keep going the way you're going? If you search up opportunity costs in YouTube, I show you exactly how you can measure opportunity costs on paper. So what's one piece of financial advice that you would give yourself? I'd love to hear from you. Chuck it in the comment. Now, again, I want to say, hey, I'm nowhere near where I want to be, but I'm very grateful to be where I am. And I'm just like you. I'm never going to stop learning. I'm going to keep seeking out mentors, discover new strategies, and take action on new things. Those are always exciting for me. If you have listened to this far, again, I only ask for one thing, and that is to leave a comment on what you enjoyed, or if you feel like there are an area we can improve, definitely leave a comment for me so that I can make these videos better. Thanks for tuning in to the Leverage Attic Podcast. Until next time, signing out.